Welcome to another edition of the RF Video Shoot Interview Series. Today we're joined by a true legend in the sport of professional wrestling, Carlos Colon. Thanks for being here today with us. Thank you for having me. No problem. I want to talk about uh, your growing up. Um, I believe you were born in Santa Isabel on the uh, southern coast of Puerto Rico. And then you, uh, I guess, moved over to Brooklyn, New York with your parents. And uh, Manhattan. Manhattan? Yeah. When you were about 13, right? 13 years old, yes. So were you a wrestling fan growing up? Uh, yeah, when I came to yeah when I came to New York, I was 13 then, and, and I started watching the, uh, Vince McMahon Sr.'s wrestling, and uh, that's when I became a fan. At age, at age 13, yeah. Okay, so who are some of the guys that you uh, grew up watching on uh, WWF? Oh, Buddy Rogers, my idol. You know, the, uh, growing up, he was, he was my favorite wrestler. Uh, the Tolos Brothers, the Kangaroos. Skull Murphy, Bruce Bernard, uh, Carl Van Hess, uh, Cowboy Babelis, Dory Dixon, Miguel Perez, and a whole bunch more. So you used to go to the uh, house shows in New York at all? Uh, at the Garden. I used to go once a month. Wow. Every four Mondays they go to the Garden. And I always made sure I, I got money to go and, and watch the. So um, basically, at, at what age did you uh, say, hey, I want to do this, I want to become a professional wrestler? Is this something that you wanted to do from an early age? Yeah, at 13 and a half I started training because uh, my brother went to school with a kid that his father was a wrestler in Colombia. And he got him interested and I used to go with him to watch uh, Barbaroja's gym. He's the one that trained uh, Pedro Morales and Victor Rivera. And he had a gym on 42nd Street. And a lot of the professional wrestlers used to go there and train. You know, with the weights. Right. And uh, Barbara Roja had a school there as well, a wrestling school. And I, I started, I, I became a member of the school when I was 13 and a half. And you pretty much, I guess you paid your dues by helping clean up the place? Yeah, I did, yeah, because a lot of time I didn't have the money to pay my, you know, my dues right. monthly. So I would help out, you know, cleaning the place and that. So at what age did you actually start training to be a wrestler? Was it early on? Uh, you know, with him, it was a very slow process. He didn't, you know, he didn't let you... Like nowadays, you see a kid uh, going to a wrestling school and in six months he's already uh, wrestling, you know, in championship matches. Uh, with Barbaroja, he did it, you know, it was three months just lifting weights. And then there was another three months learning how to fall. And you did nothing but falls. You know, if he ever caught you trying to throw a drop kick or do things, you know, right. without his supervision, you know, you get, you get hell. Right, exactly. <laughs> For you, early on, taking the bumps and, and learning how to take bumps, was that more difficult for you than uh, learning the psychology of the business? I mean, No, the psychology is definitely the hardest part of the, of the sport, really. Right. And nobody can teach you that. Only time. Right. It comes to time. So were you ever discouraged at a young age uh, when you started taking bumps? Did you ever say to yourself, hey, maybe this isn't for me, or is this... Well, I had, with Robert Roll, like he brought you up the hard way, and uh, I had my ankle broken once. Right. And that put me out for about six months, and you know I thought about it, and, and and that's when I really decided that this is one, this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Right. All right. Talk about your training. Uh, what was a typical week like for you when you started training? Well, I used to go to junior high school at that time, so I get out of school at three o'clock, and then I would go over there by four, and I wouldn't get home till about nine o'clock. Wow. It was a four or five hours every day, and I, I enjoyed it. I wish. It will, we had longer hours because you know I enjoyed it so much. Right, right. So how long was it uh, before you started actually wrestling your your debut match? As far as like the training went, you trained. For well, in the, in that school with Barbaroa, he had a he had, he had matches for the older guys, guys that knew how to wrestle then, and uh, he used to run them every Sunday. So it took me about a year, about a year. You know, I was fourteen, and I was, in, in, you know, participating in the weekly cars that he used to run. Would you consider him your mentor? Yeah, my mentor. Yeah, my, my everything. He's, okay. he's the best trainer rest, you know, in wrestling that I've ever seen. And I believe your very first match, uh, your debut, was uh, against Bobo Brazil? No, no, Hobo. Hobo? At that time, uh, Tony Santos promotions in Boston. Okay. Uh, they used to run, and, and Jack Pfeffer was his partner. So he liked to copy everything Vince McMahon did up in New York. Right. So they had a Bruno San Martino. Instead of San Martino... It was Sam Nartino. Huh. His real name was Pancho Rosario. Wow. And I was Prince Kukuya. Because at the time, Vince had a big, you know, Curtis Ayukia. Right. He was in New York, so he, 
he called me Prince Kukuya. It was a Hawaiian gimmick, right? Uh, yeah. It was an islander, you know, more like Jamaica, but the name was uh, na it was named after Ikea. Okay. Now, from uh, that period of time, you worked a lot of other independent shows or companies. What are some of the other companies? No, they weren't, they weren't like now. Like, uh, I only worked for him because he was very strict. You know, if you were one of his students, you couldn't be running around, you know, wrestling for these outlaw promoters. Okay. So I stayed there till I went to Boston and broke in at 17 for Tony Santos. Okay. And then eventually you moved to Canada, to Montreal. Uh, Montreal, yeah, in 79, I went to Montreal. Is that where you met your uh, wife, Nancy? Or? Yeah, my wife, yeah, I met her there. Did you work at all in any of the territories of Canada? I know you worked yeah, for, for two hard, for, in and out for five years. I want to talk about that coming up, definitely. So, um, And then you, you regularly worked for WWWF in 1968 and 69 as a lower card guy, correct? Yeah, yeah the TV uh, guy. Right, you worked with uh, Johnny Rods? Johnny Rods, Pete Sanchez. Sanchez. What are some of your memories about uh, working those guys? Thomas Married. oh great, yeah, great, great guys, yeah. Memories of uh, Gorilla Monsoon. Monsoon this too. He helped with a lot. I used to wrestle him a lot in handicap matches. Easy to get along with outside the ring. Yeah, he was a good guy. Yeah. Obviously, yeah, later on friends. down the line, you became partners. Yeah, partners, partners and good friends. Yeah. We'll talk about that coming up. What are some of your memories of uh, your early memories of uh, Lou Albano? Oh, Albano, he was, he was a great guy too. He was crazy. Yeah, I love Lou. Big time uh, partier outside the ring. Yeah, we traveled a lot because you know I didn't have a car, so. Uh, we traveled with Arnold Scotland to Washington D.C. every Thursday for TV. Right. And Lou Albano was always along. drinking and stuff like that. Yeah. Is so when we come back, he always get a six, you know, twelve pack of beer, and he was, he was a party guy. Now around this period of time for WWWF, when you were working in that territory in you know the late '60s, what are some of the territories like? Where on the East Coast would you uh, work? What were some of the towns? Uh, for for the WWF? Yeah, for WWF, besides oh, New York. Uh, Boston, uh, all over Jersey. You know, Pennsylvania, Scranton. Right. Okay. Allentown, Hamburg, uh, Maryland. We used to go to uh, Baltimore. And Manassas, Virginia. Bangor, Maine. Augusta, Maine. Portland, Maine. All those towns. Springfield, Mass. Any uh, towns stick out as being uh, some of your favorites to go to early on? No, my favorite was the garden. The garden. That, that, that was a bit spay day. Right. <laughs> what was it like working uh, the garden for the very first time for you, being that support of, you know, the Mecca? Oh, it was a dream come true. That's, that's, that's a dream for most athletes. Right, you know, right. We're boxers, basketball players, you know. That's the most famous arena in the world. Were you nervous first time going yeah, into Yeah, yeah, very nervous, yeah. What are your memories about Baron McGill's Cluna? I had great matches with him. I learned a lot from him. Good guy. The original Sheik? Memories of uh, the original Ed Farhard? Ed Farhard, I, I didn't wrestle him much, you know, maybe once or twice in New York when he came in to wrestle Bruno. I, I, I wrestled him on TV a couple of times. Easy to get along with? Uh, yeah, he was, his matches, the matches with him were very short. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Killer Kowalski, you worked uh, with Killer uh, Kowalski. Too. Yeah, a great, a great uh, in-ring performer. One of the best villains I ever worked against and I ever seen. Thunderbolt uh, Patterson, you worked with uh, Thunderbolt. Very talented young fellow. Good guy. Yeah. What was uh like working for Vince McMahon Senior? Hell, he was a gentleman. He was a very very nice person to work for. And he was straight. You know, he he always tell you the truth. You know, if he didn't have anything for you, he'd tell you. Right. Yeah. You always give you the handshake with the money too at the end of the night, right? Yeah, yeah. The Vince McMahon handshake. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's one now, of the true gentlemen in the business. Did you know uh, Vince Jr. at the time when you were there? Was he still coming up as the announcer at ringside? No, or was no. He not I, even I, in the business yet? Like, when he when he became involved in the business, I was already. You were gone. Puerto gone here yeah, in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess also you, you Pedro Morales was there. He joined the WWF in 1970. Yeah, he also worked for us in Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, before that, when he, he got the big push as a, you know, I guess it was at the, uh, well, he became champion, obviously, at the Intercontinental Champion at one point. Do you think if you stayed in the WWF longer that you would have had his spot and maybe uh, been champion or? I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I, I never thought of that because at that time, uh, the old man liked to feature Big Ben, you know? Right. And uh, I was... Five ten and a half, five eleven, uh, two hundred and thirty pounds. That wasn't very big at the time. 
What were your plans, I mean, for your goals at this period of time? Did you My goals is what, what, I, what I really became, you know, to become a, a promoter in my own island, Puerto Rico. And, so and you I, knew that in the back of your mind that eventually you would want to... That's what I really hope for, you know, and I... It was hard at the time because I didn't have the money. And to be a promoter anywhere, you need, you need some money. Right. But thank God, you know, I was able to, to fulfill that dream. Okay. We'll definitely talk about that coming up. Um, what was your opinion on Pedro Morales? Did you like him as a, as a worker? Or as a yeah, so I, I, I was a fan of him, of his, you know, I, I like his work. So you always got along with him? And I got along with him, he's a tremendous person. Talk about uh, the very first time you met Abdul the Butcher. Would that be in Montreal? In Montreal the first time, yeah. We came to the church, or I was already there. Right. So he came up to my room and, and, and he asked me, uh, well, you know, Everybody, when you go to a new church, or you want to know what's going on, right. who's here, and, and I, and I, I told him, I told him, you know, everything he needed to know. What were your uh, impressions of him? Did you like him as a as a person? Uh, well, I, I always thought and still think that Abdullah one, was one of the greatest drawing cards in in our sport. He's the only guy that could get over and, and fill an arena in, with two times on TV. Without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, you know, when he was young, 40 years ago, well, you just bring him to your TV and, and you got to sell out at night if you have a show. Right, right. We'll talk about uh, Abby because you used him a lot down the islands coming up. We'll talk about him. Um, you also worked for uh, Stu Hart? Stu Hart, yes. I learned a lot with him. What are your memories about Stu Hart? Oh, it was great. I, I love the territory, you know. Even though it was very cold and I come from, from a warm climate. Right. The Caribbean, but... There, it was just something about the territory that, you know, that you love. Right, right. And I would stay a year or two, and i leave, and I'd say, ah, I'll never come back. And in six months, I was back there again. Hmm. What was Stu Hart like as a promoter? Let's, let's talk about Stu. Was he very tough? Or? No, well, if, 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 if you did your you job and, and you work hard, he, he was very nice. He was very nice to me. I, I don't have anything bad to say about him. He paid me well. He treated me well. And he ran a good territory, you know. Did you have a good spot in his company when you were there? Yeah, I was on top there for five years. I was one of his main stars, as he called me. What are your memories of uh, his kids early on when they were just... Oh, I know them all. They were all good kids. They're all different, you know. Right. But they, they're nice guys, yeah. What about his wife, uh, Helen? I, I never... I knew her. I met her a few times, but when I was there, you know, she, you didn't see much of her. Right. She stayed home most of the time, and I, I never went to the dungeon, you know. I, never, I was okay. there five years. And I never went there except, you know, once in a while to, to meet him to go to Edmonton or some town. Right. Yeah. What were the uh, drives like uh, in Calgary? Because we've done interviews with guys in the past and they always talk about the long road trips. They were long trips, but they, I enjoyed them. It was, you know, good roads and we all had a six pack coming back, so it was fun, you know. Now, pretty much the, the drives there were really brutal because of the weather and stuff like that. You have Sometimes, any... the winter time was, was brutal, yeah, but. Is it true that sometimes you would have to drive over lakes that were frozen over to get different towns? I never had to do that. Okay. But we had to drive, you know, on roads that you couldn't see, you know. They call it whiteout. Right. Where, where the field on the road was all one, you didn't know where you were going. Oh, that's crazy. But I, I was always, I was lucky to always ride with uh, the booker, the late uh, Dave Rule. Okay. May God rest his soul. And he was one of the greatest drivers I've ever seen. Now, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, there's a story that goes around that you were driving, I believe, from Medicine Hat to uh, Saskatoon in October of 72. And I guess you felt sick or something like that. You wanted him to roll down the window. and No, it was, it was from uh, Medicine Hat to Saskatoon, yeah. Well, what exactly happened in that car ride? Well, it was, you know, we were, had a few beers and we got into an argument and... and, and you know, got in a little fight, and, and, and he, he fell and, and banged his head, and that was the end of his career. That was pretty much it? I regret that. Yeah, yeah, I was, you know, when I think about that, I feel bad. Did, um, I guess, did you guys make up after that, or was it pretty much... No, I never saw him again after that, but I felt very bad, and I wanted to see him to apologize, but I never had the opportunity. Now, I believe Abby was also up in Calgary, and uh, yeah. you guys had your first series of bloody matches up there. It drew very well. Very well, yeah. What are your memories of uh, working with Abby in uh, Calgary? Stampede? Oh, great, yeah, because Abby was in his prime. He, was, he only weighed like 280. Right. And he moved like a cat. He could run uh, backwards for, uh, faster than most guys can run forward. 
Did you see the potential in him? Did you think he was going to be a huge box office? Did you know right oh, away? Oh, he was, he was already in box office then, even then, you know. Right. It was a shame. I always told him that he never had the opportunity to work in New York. Why did Because he would have set all records there, I'm telling you. Knowing okay. the fans there. I grew up there, so I know how the fans are. Why do you think you never went to New York for a I don't know. I don't know. You think politics? And Maybe. He didn't like to be controlled? or No, because he, he was easy. He worked for me, and, and you know. Right. Uh, you know, you don't have to control anybody. You can, you know, you can do business without controlling, you know, the wrestlers. Right, right. It seems to me Abby would have been a perfect fit in like the early '80s when Hogan was on top and oh, yeah. Abby and as the monster heel, and you know, they you would know, have set all kinds of records, man. Without a doubt. Really, because uh, and and he 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 regrets that too, because Abby really wanted. That was one of his dreams. That's I was I was happy when I saw him getting the Hall of Fame because that that meant a lot to him. Did he ever contact the office back then? WWE ever like or WWF back then? Did they ever contact Abby about coming in at all? Or no, no, he, he would have gone. If he would have went in a heartbeat. Yeah, if he would have heard that they were trying to get a hold of him, he would have driven there himself, <laughs> because that was his dream. He really he wanted to work the garden. Wow. Do you think he had a bad reputation in the business at all for them? I don't the know. I don't or? know. Maybe somebody about mouth him. I don't know. I really couldn't tell you, but they they they, they miss an opportunity to make big money with him. Okay, um, from Because he drew money wherever he went. There's not one place that right, exactly. he went that didn't draw money. Especially Big Japan, money. Right, in Japan as well, too. That's why in the Hall of Fame, uh, Terry Funk talked about it. And he said, you know, wherever he went, he was box office. I'm going to talk about Abby more in, in depth, especially uh, for working for you down in, uh, in Puerto Rico. And I want to talk to you about other stuff regarding him as well coming up. Um, we'll talk about that coming up. Um, from there, after uh, Stu Hart's promotion, where did you go from there? Is that when you went to Puerto Rico and started up? Uh, from there, yeah, I came. Yeah, yeah, I, I came to uh, Ontario for the Bear Man. You, you know, you, you know him, right? Who is it again? The Bear Man. I'm not sure. Uh, Dave McKinley. No, go. you can tell definitely talk about it. Yeah, he used to run in the summertime around Toronto. You know, the Ontario province. Right. And uh, he used to use guys like Angelo Mosca. Bulldog Brower. Right. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Angela Mosca? Good memory. Yeah, good guy. Yeah. Good guy? Yeah. What about uh, Bulldog Brower? Yeah, he was a nice guy. So I got along with everybody in the business. I, I, I really can I don't have any one that I can say that I didn't get along with. Now, I believe you, you met uh, Victor Jovica for the very first time in, in, in Calgary. Calgary. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Victor? Well, he's still my partner. We've been right, in exactly. business together for almost 40 years. Wow, that's a long period. And he was the one that financed my dream. You know, I, and, and I really appreciate what he did because he, did, first of all, he didn't know me that well. He didn't know Puerto Rico, you know, he didn't know the language. Right. He was at my mercy, really, I, you know. He took all his money, all his savings. He sold all his properties and he came to someone with me and uh, he let me, you know, run the show. So let's talk about how the company started uh, Capital Sports Promotions. You had a vision, you had a dream, and it's something that you wanted to do and you know start up a company in Puerto Rico. Now at this time, was there any other companies running the island at that time? No, at that time, no. Uh, Florida Championship Wrestling used to run there before. Right. But it had been a year, over a year, almost two years, that we didn't have any wrestling in the island. That's one of the reasons I, I decided to go then. Now I believe when you were talking about the Florida promoter, his name was uh, Clarence... Eddie, Eddie Graham. Oh, it was Eddie Graham who was running. Yeah, Eddie. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I know Eddie. I didn't know. If, I have another name, Clarence uh, Luteral. I don't know. If uh, Cowboy Luteral, you mean? They yeah. were partners. Okay, they were partners. Yeah. He yeah. was partners with Eddie. Eddie. Yeah, he was blind. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they were running there in the '60s, and they used <clears> a lot of NWA talent, I believe, right? But never used Puerto Rican wrestlers in a prominent role. Uh, one or two, yeah. Okay. What, we didn't have very many at the time, you know, that were professional enough to to be. Part of you know, right. for the championship wrestling. That was one of the best territories. Oh yeah, in the world at the time. Did you ever work for Eddie at all? For a yeah, bit? in and out. For, I used to come to Puerto Rico and, and do matches for them a lot. Who, who'd you work when with? When Dory Funk was booking. Right. When on the Lay Wahoo McDonald's was booking. Okay. What are your memories of uh, Eddie Graham? Because I a lot of a lot. people say he's probably one of the best Finnish guys in the business. Yeah, yeah. I learned a lot. I met him at his house about two or three times, and and, and every time I went. What are some, I learned a ton. What are some of the most valuable lessons that you've learned from Eddie Graham? Well, how to run the business, you know, like, uh, he always believed in, you know, he didn't want to hot shot and, you know, 
just keep it basic and and it's true when you don't have all that crazy stuff your territories last longer and, and, and you do better business for a longer period of time less is more basically or yeah he was he's, he's more basic kind of a guy more wrestling holes right which is the name of the game now you had mentioned that you were down there when uh, Dory Funk Jr. was uh, booking right yeah what are your memories of uh, Dory Funk great yeah Dory is one of the best technical wrestlers in the business and then you know meetings with him and Eddie were you know, a lot of the guys wish they could they could spend an hour talking to those guys. So you would just pretty much sit back and, and take it all in and I spent all day there with them, yeah. And even though I had my had successful business at the time. Right. But you know, it's never too late to learn. I learned more, you know, talking to those guys. Any other valuable lessons that you learned uh, from from those from Eddie Graham especially or? Uh, yeah, I learned a lot, you know, like I said, to, to, to run the business the way it should, should have been run. And uh you know, he had a lot of a lot of common sense about right. about life or everything. You know, when you came in for Eddie, did you work the loop or did you come in just for TVs? I, I do a couple of times. I go to uh, I come in on Monday, do uh, West Palm, do, do the TV on Tuesday morning. Right. Uh, work Tampa that afternoon, that evening, and do Miami and fly back from Miami, fly back to Puerto Rico. Okay. Now then, Puerto Rico, um, you talked a little bit about you know teaming up with Victor Jovic and starting the company. How did Gorilla Monsoon uh, get involved as well? Because he, I believe he was your partner too. Yeah, he was. Yeah, Early on. we were friends from New York, and, and yeah. So basically, how did everything come together, like uh, to start up the company? You had the vision, and you had you know Victor had the money, and, and what was uh, Gorilla Monsoon's role in this? No, we just made it, he wanted to be part of our organization. We, we didn't need to sell. Anybody, we just wanted him to be with us because he, you know, he wanted to be part of it. Yeah. What, what year did uh, it start? 1973, I believe? 73 we started the company, yeah. Who were some of the uh, early talents that you brought in to uh, start using at that point in time? Uh, we used mainly uh, guys that had the talent but never had the opportunity to work on top in anywhere. You know, like uh, Rick Martel's brother. Right. Michelle, Frenchie Martin. Okay. And they, they used to go as the Martel brothers. Pierre Martel and Michelle Martel, and uh, Gil Hayes from Calgary. Right. Uh, Dan Ken, he's from Detroit. You know, Al Costello, they were the kangaroos for us. Uh, Kurt Van Hess, he was from Canada. Right. A lot, a lot of the new guys that I worked with when I was on the road that I knew had the talent to, to be on top, and, and I gave them the opportunity, and they drew big money for us. Now, did you have TV right away off the bat? Yeah, we had TV, yeah. Right yeah. off the bat? Because I always knew, as a kid, that you couldn't run this business without TV. Right, exactly. All right, well, what was the schedule like in Puerto Rico? How many days would you work? Uh, I know now it's like four days, Sunday to... There, there were times that we were running, like, in the summertime, two times a night, seven days a week. Wow. How are you we did that about two or three years. How, uh, but how usually we run, like, TV on Wednesday. And then we run towns Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, house shows. How were you drawing early on? Good, very good, yeah, big. We used to run twice on Sunday, so Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening. Wow. What was the typical crowd? Oh, we can go anywhere from 2,000 to 37,000 was the best one we ever had. What year was that? That was, I think, uh, 85, I think, if I'm not mistaken. It was... Uh, Bruce Brody and Stan Hansen versus Abdullah and myself. Okay, I, and me and Abdullah have been feuding for almost two, 15 years. And then uh, I had this thing going with Brody and Hansen, and I couldn't beat him. I picked every partner I could think of. And nothing happened, so I figured, well, I better take a chance with Abby. So I flew over to San Antonio where he was wrestling at the time, had a meeting with him, his manager. And uh, he agreed. and. We brought the match to our anniversary in Puerto Rico, and we turned them away from the higher beat through the stadium. That's amazing. Let's talk about the fans down there in Puerto Rico um, before we get more into the company itself. We've done interviews with a lot of guys that worked at Territory, and they said the fans down there, if you're a heel, you're in a lot of trouble because they riot, they throw batteries at you. Uh, how would you compare the fans in Puerto Rico to the ones that live here in the United States? Obviously, Puerto Rico is part of the United States, but... They 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 they're hot. They they were very hot, you know. And they I, they they believe the sport, and 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 they would get behind a, their favorite wrestler. And if you were a heel, and you did 
you know, bad things, you know, they go after you. But we had good security, really. I mean, very rare uh, somebody got hurt from a fan, you know. Well, a, lot of, a lot of the guys like to exaggerate more to make themselves tougher. Right. But it was not as bad as it sounds, as they make it sound, you know. What was the worst thing that you've seen uh, a fan do down in Puerto Rico? Well, they, they, they throw, a couple of them threw rocks sometimes, you know, a couple of times. But right. Our security made sure that, you know, they would search him and, and somebody got out of hand, they'd take him out right away. I think the last time I was in Puerto Rico was in 2000. It was for Victor's uh, IWA. And uh, just the crowd heat was amazing. I mean, the fans yeah. still believe that it's, you know, a legit sport and, you know, they don't know that it's a work. Why, why do you think the magic is still safe and, and sacred in, in Puerto Rico and, and not like here in the States where... Well, it's, 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 it's not like that anymore. It's, you know, it's, it's a little bit like here. Right. Yeah, it's not, you don't see that, those riots that you used to see years ago. Right, right. Let's talk about uh, Victor Quiones. When uh, how did Victor get involved within the company? I know he was the uh, godson of uh, Gorilla. No, he we he, like... he, as a as a young kid, we 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 he was only fourteen. He, he worked for us, selling tickets. Right. And he learned a lot from us about the business, and that's how he you know he, was he, got, he got to girl. to be a promoter. Yeah. Did you get along with Victor uh, yeah. early on? Yeah, I got along with him. Yeah. Um, also, early on in WWC, uh, you feuded with uh, Gorilla Monsoon. He came in. Uh, yeah, we do big business. Yeah. Er Ernie Ladd. Ernie Ladd. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Ernie Ladd? Good. Good. They were all great guys, you know, to work with. Killer Carl uh, Krupp. Krupp. So yeah, he was a little more, you know, uh, controversial, but we, we we handled him. What is that? He was like, uh, uh, I guess, like. Uh, temperamentally, you know, he, he would get mad for. With egos. Not so much ego. He's just crazy. <laughs> right. Also, uh, I believe I Eric the Red too. You know, right? Eric the Red, yeah. I don't want to pronounce his uh, name wrong. Pampiro uh, Firpo. Firpo, yeah, Firpo, yeah. And then uh, Mongolian Stomper came what? into the territory. Stomper too, yeah. We had everybody. You know, the, we have some cards that you know I go through my old books. Right. And we have bigger names than anybody in, in the country at the time. Without a doubt. Yeah. All at the same time, same night. Now the Moon Dogs. We had uh, Andre the Giant. We had Abdullah. We had. Uh, the Stomper that night, uh, Eddie Gilbert and his father, Tommy Gilbert, Tommy and Dutch Mantel, Savvy Vega. I mean, we're going to talk about all these guys coming up. So, um, I mean, everybody who's ever been a name in the business at one point in time have come to your you know company and, and worked for you. So, I mean, everybody's been through there. So. Yeah. Uh, how did you get involved with All Japan? I believe in 1979 you went over for uh, Bob. Through, through Abby, Abby Abdullah got me the opportunity. What do you remember? That was a good experience, yeah. What are your memories of uh, Giant Baba? Good, good. Another guy, too, an honorable man. Good promoter? Yeah, good promoter. What are your memories of uh, working with uh, Abby over there? You guys were a tag team. Yeah. One time. Just once? Yeah, one time. When you went over to Japan, um, you know, compared to working in Puerto Rico, because it's a lot stiffer style uh, in Japan. It's not, it's not so much stiffer, it's just that it's a different style. It's, Kind of like a go, 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 go. Not that much psychology to it, you know? Right. Were you it, it's, a, it's not like Mexico, but it's different because Mexican wrestling is different than American wrestling. And even though Japan is not as aerial as the Mexican wrestling, but it's, it's more like a like go, go, go type of wrestling. Were you able to get uh, accustomed to the style right away? Or did yeah, it take I did. Some time yeah, it, to? it took a little time, but it, I, after the first week, I, I got the groove of it. Now, I believe when you went over there early on, you worked regularly with uh, Jumbo Sheruta and Mil Mascaris? Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Jumbo Sheruta? Good, good, good wrestler too. It's solid. What about uh, Mil Mascaris? Good, good. Yeah, he, 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 was, he, he mixed the red Mexican style with the American. It's good. Now, a lot of people that we talked to said that he might have had an ego. Um, do you think he was an egomaniac at all? No, 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 I don't know. He... he he was a talented guy, and, and, and he knew it, you know, and he didn't let anybody, you know, put him down. So, if that's being an egomaniac, then... Right. He is. <laughs> right. Now, you also worked with uh, Giant Baba, I believe, too, yeah. right? Yeah, I worked with everybody there, because I, I was there several times, trips, and in those days, the tours were like, the shortest one was three weeks. Wow. So, I was there four weeks, twice, and then one time I was there three weeks. Any good uh, road stories from all Japan? Oh, yeah, I had a lot of fun there because, you know, it, it gave me a break from my business. Right. 
uh, it gave me a chance to be one of the boys again for four weeks. Yeah, I was going to ask you, would you guys stop promoting shows in Puerto Rico at all? Or no, no, they kept going. No, we, we, had a good, we, we had a good company, and uh, I was not the only star. We had the Invaders there that were hot. We had uh, Eddie Gilbert was hot at one time, and Will had some American baby faces that were on top. Who, who was your booker early on uh, in the 70s? Who was your main booker? Was it you? Well, I was always the booker, really. Right. I had guys, you know, work in the dressing room to keep the, the discipline and stuff, but, but, you know, we... For creative, it was Yeah, much... it was more, uh, us, yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about Mexico. You, you mentioned uh, Mil Mascaris, obviously, uh, one of the top Mexican stars. You, I think you went down there in 1982, and, and you worked uh, at least one match in Mexico, right? I worked a few matches there. I worked with uh, Canek. Right. I worked with Pedro Aguayo. El Santo? El Santo. No, El Santo, I worked with him in Puerto Rico as, as his partner. Okay. They filmed a movie, he was filming a movie, Noche de San Juan. And uh, in that, inside the movie they had that one match, which was uh, him and I as a team against uh, Barabas, who was our main, one of our main heroes, and Rebelde Rojo. That was the guy that I was wrestling in Mexico. Right. Um, the Mexican style Lucha Libre, were you able to get accustomed to it? The very first time you went over to uh, Ah, it took me like like Japan, you know, a couple of times, because the tag team they do a lot of tag teams over there, and, and they there you don't them. tag. You just gotta know when to come in and when to get out. Right, right. And that was a little confusing at first, but I got I got I got I got used to it. Do you think that style could get over in Puerto Rico, the lucha style, or do you think? See, it's the when when, I, when we started our company, the one thing I always wanted to do is to uh, mix the Mexican wrestling. You know, for their moves, fancy moves, the acrobatics, and the American style of wrestling for the timing, psychology, and right. And we had great success doing that. That's why we're a little, we're a little faster than the Americans, but a little slower than the Mexicans. <laughs> you guys definitely. It's a, it's a good style, you know. Right. And it was easy for the American guys when they come over to adapt to our style. What are your memories of uh, El Canek? Good, good. Big guy for, for a Mexican at that time, he was big and good performer. When you went to Mexico, how long were your tours there for? No, I just go in for a, a, a night or two and get out. But I did that a few times. Now, I believe, I don't know what year this was, uh, WWC was eventually invited to join the NWA. Uh, and then you no, had, we were part of the NWA for years. Right. And until you, until it closed. So you had you had access to a lot of the top guys. Like yeah, we were, come in we, we, had, we were pretty powerful there. Uh, my partner was a member of the board of directors for many years. What are your memories of uh, Ric Flair when he would come into the territory? Yeah, he was a big business. All, all the champions, the NW champions, when they come in, they, they do big for us. Now you guys had the big unification match, I believe it was in January of 83, but uh, for whatever reason the match never aired outside of Puerto Rico. It was never really officially recognized as a title change by the NWA. What were the politics behind this? It was no politics, it was just uh, we wanted to have our own champion and, and uh, we had a, our world WWC champion. Right. And then Ric Flair was the NWA champion. And we wanted to create a different title, like the Universal title. And that's how it was born. We had a match, Flair and I, a unification match. And I, I, I beat him for that. And then I became the Universal champion. And we did away with the world title, and then we used the Universal title. And not, still today, the title is still going. So it started from that match pretty much? For that match, yeah. Let's talk about Ric Flair. Was he easy to do business with when he came into the territory? Or? Yeah, he was easy, yeah. Rick is a good guy. He's a good friend too, you know. We, right. Besides, you know, we're good friends. So that... Easy to work with in the ring? Easy to work with, easy to do business with. It's easy. What's he like outside the ring? Uh, he's a party guy, you know. Right, exactly. <laughs> he is. <laughs> what you see is what you get with him. Real life gimmicks a shoot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, uh, Ed Farhat came in, the original Sheik, I believe, in 1982, worked the territory for a year. Yeah, he worked, he did business too, yeah. Good business? Yeah. Okay. Now, you're, you're feud with Abdul the Butcher to this day, you know, you watch the videotapes, it's probably one of the most legendary feuds of all time in, in WWC. I remember watching it as a fan myself and, and getting the videotapes and, you know, rewinding some of the stuff you guys did. I think not only WWC, I think around the world, because I go to many places, you know, different countries. And they talk about it. You they guys ask me about it. 
yeah, you guys pretty much had some of the biggest drawing gates because of that match. Yeah. Um, you guys would have death matches and uh, brawl over the building, barbed wire matches, chain matches. What are, uh, I guess, some of the memorable matches that stick out in your, in your feud with Abby? What are some of the matches that you remember the most? Uh, what barbed wire matches, man? I had a few of them. They, they were unforgettable. Easy to work? or yeah, Easy, yeah. yeah. Wire. But you had, to, you had to be in shape to work Abby because he... He was on your ass, I mean, and if you didn't, you know, if you fall asleep, he eat you up. <laughs> Memories of the uh, famous angle where Abby blinded you with a... Yeah, that was the biggest house we ever drew. Pneumonia. Singles, you know. Right. Going against each other, yeah. I was out for six weeks, and when I came back, we sold out the Beethoven again, you know, people all over. The, we had about 15,000 people on the ground. Wow. And all the stands were full. Now, what do you think about the most recent news with Abdullah Butcher testing positive for hepatitis C? Do, do you think uh, it's true, or what are your thoughts on the whole entire situation? I don't know. I don't know. It's a very sad thing, you know, think that that should never happen because, you know, if it's true that they have it, you know, how do you tell who gave it to who? Right. Have you, know? you ever been tested for it at all? Or? No, I'm fine. I don't have it. Oh, I mean, did yeah. you, when you heard the story, did you get tested, or did you get tested before? Before, yeah. Okay. Have, uh, I guess, you know, in Puerto Rico, the style is, is so violent and, you know, we'll talk about blading and stuff like that. Has it ever caused you to reevaluate, I guess, the practice of blading at all? Did you ever say, all right, maybe we should do less blood now with all the dangers out there with uh, diseases or? Well, we never, in our territory, there's not that much blood. Not anymore. Even, even then it was not, you know, it was, it's less now, but. Right. Even then it was not like people say like every night, no. Right, right. Um, you know, the big story is with that kid, Devin Nicholson, uh, the Canadian wrestler, suing Abby for giving him the disease, allegedly. Um, he also worked for you down uh, in Puerto Rico. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on him as, as a worker and as a person? I mean, he's a nice kid. He's kind of quiet, awful quiet, you know. Right. But he was a decent worker? Yeah, Irish, yeah. He, he claims, I don't know how true it is again, um, he said that he didn't know that Abby, you know, he didn't give Abby permission to blade him. Um, do you, did you ever know Abby to blade somebody without, you know, one of the workers giving you permission? I never heard of it, that before. Right. Um, now you guys really shifted towards, I guess it was the late 80s, a, a very violent, you know, style of professional wrestling. What did you think about, uh, you know, Victor was with you guys, and uh, I would say Victor maybe looked up to you as, as you know, you might have been Victor's mentor. Uh, what do you think about Victor going over to Japan and starting up the wing promotion, and obviously Anita, Anita sorry, Starting up uh, the FMW promotion in Japan using your style. Did you? Uh, what, did, what were your thoughts on that? I never gave much thought because I didn't know much of it. You know, I didn't. I didn't. I heard they had a little company there, but I didn't know. I didn't have details. Right. Uh, how also, they run it. Didn't really interfere with your business either. No, 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 no. What, and we always dealt with the big ones there, Baba and Inoki and, and International when they had it. Right. Mr. Uh, Yoshihara. Okay. Now Eddie Gilbert, when he came into your company, you know he was there in the early '90s, and eventually he became booker for ECW. And uh, Paul Heyman, you know, started ECW as well, taking over uh, for Eddie as, as the booker. What did you think of the uh, modern day uh, hardcore wrestling in, in uh, ECW? The use of uh, the tables, the ladders, chairs, glass, and the thumbtacks. You, you guys, pretty much done a lot of that early on. Yeah, well, we didn't over. You didn't overdo do it, it like they're doing it. And, right. and what they do, you know, they're killing it because now they see one table, they see two tables, they see. It doesn't mean anything. You guys did it. At first, it, you know, it, it was like a an eye opener. But now that they've seen it so much, I don't think it means much. Right, right. All right, let's talk about. Um, well, did you watch ECW when it first came on at all? I watched a few, a few, a few, a few, a few uh, episodes, but not, not to, it's not my. My thing, you know. It was you weren't into the product. No, no. Okay. Um, going back to the fans, you know, with the reputation of violence, is it true that several foreign wrestlers demanded increased security measures? Like, uh, I guess after the, after, I believe Brody was even attacked by a fan one time with a with a knife, and um, seats were removed. I guess further from the ring. Who? Uh, the fans when they attacked Brody with a knife at one point in time. No, that's not true. Never. Okay. No, not never. That I, that I, I, I didn't know if that was true as far as like uh, the, the seats being pushed back further. No, 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 no. We never had to take this measure. Okay. It was not. They make it like I said. They make it sound worse like, than it really was, but right. it wasn't that bad. Any uh, stories from working exotic locations such as uh, Dominican Republic at all, or, or Trinidad, or the Virgin Islands? Yeah, we still we we have our TV program in Trinidad. 
still. And our plan is to reopen that area again. We were there before and we were very successful. We drew some big, big crowds in Trinidad. You had the big riot, I think, over uh, there in the early 80s with Abby. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that. Maybe and the fans there were a lot harder than they were in Puerto Rico. The other thing, right. people don't hear much of that, about that. But what are your memories of the, uh, the riot that happened over there in Trinidad? Were you nervous uh, with the armed soldiers at all? No, they, they, it was not really a riot. They, they just that the security there, they, they wear that that kind of uniform. And right. It, it looked like uh, army people, but they're not. Okay. Obviously, you were married to uh, Abby for a long time. You guys had a huge program together, and eventually it spilled over to the NWA in the States uh, for Starkey in 83. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, facing Abby at uh, the Greensboro show, Starkey in 83? It was a great experience because uh, I didn't know that that few had that much interest, you know, in the States. Right. And when I got in the ring and, and I hit Abby, I mean, that place became uh, unglued. Did you ever at uh, any point in time want to come back to the States full time and uh, work here after, you know, working for the NWA in the early 83 or 84? Or, or was you I, I, I wanted to, but I didn't have time because, you know, we're so busy running the Caribbean. Right. Not only, you know, four towns in Puerto Rico, then. Every every two weeks we go to Trinidad and run three towns there, Barbados and, and one in Barbados and, and two in Trinidad. Do you also work for uh, Joe Blanchard for Southwest Yeah, Wrestling? yeah, I did. Yeah, I did quite a few things. Who was uh, in that territory when you went down there? Was uh, it was uh, it was uh, no, Tully wasn't there. He had just left. Okay. Uh, the Shivers. Luke and Bush. Luke and Bush. They were running it. Right. And uh, Man Manny there. Fernandez, Al Perez. Bob Sweetan was still there. No, Sweetan yeah. wasn't there. I think he came after, or he was there before. Right. Uh, Al Madrill. Okay. Bobby yeah, Jaggers. Crew, Bob, Bob, Bobby Jaggers, uh, Eric Embry, Bobby Fulton. Right. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, Bobby Jaggers, who, you know, he played a big role in uh, in your company in Puerto Rico? Yeah, he worked a lot for him. We like Bobby. He's a good guy. Easy to work with? Easy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are your memories of uh, the Sheep Herders? Good. They 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 did big business for us. They had the uh, infamous, I believe. Who did they work? Uh, it was Invaders. The, uh, the Invaders, the yeah. Barbed wire match. Yeah, the bar, yeah. They did a good business for you guys. Big business, yeah. Yeah. Are, are you um, surprised when they went to uh, the WWF and kind of like got rid of the gimmick and became the Bushwhackers when they were pretty much the most violent tag team in the business? And yeah. Then, <laughs> I was happy for them. I, you know, it showed that you know they could get over. They can versatile. Yeah. Right. Okay. What are your memories of? Uh, I guess the boxer versus wrestler match with the late uh, Joe Fraser in 1984. Yeah, that was that was a good 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 angle. How, good how did that work. come about? Uh, you mean the outcome? Yeah, no, I just how did the whole angle start? Well, I heard before in the past that you know that wrestler versus remember when Inoki fought uh, Ali? Yes. And that was a successful deal. So I figured, well, why not do it here? Then you know now. Right. In Puerto Rico, and, and we got in touch with uh, Frazier's people, and we did it, and it was great. He also refereed for us one of my matches in Trinidad. Is that the one with uh, you and Brody? No, no. Okay. It was me and Abby, I think. Okay. Well, I, I don't know. I have my notes that uh, one time you worked Brody, and I guess he was the referee, and I guess the finish called for Frazier punching Brody, who was apparently paranoid that he was going to get double-crossed or legit knocked out. I don't know if there's any truth. I don't remember. I, I didn't think it was Brody, but if you say it was. Yeah, I think, I think it's Brody. Yeah, that's what it said. Okay. And he wrestled, he wrestled Jovica in, uh, he fought Jovica in Trinidad. Really? Yeah. How, how was that? It was good. <laughs> Boxer versus wrestler. When you, um, when you fought him, I believe the match only won about five rounds. When I fought who? Uh, when, when you fought Frazier. No, I never fought Frazier. You never, you never pinned him in a wrestling match. No, 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 never, okay. never, no, 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 no. So who, who did? I wasn't that crazy. Yeah. Uh, who did he actually work? Was it? Victor? He, he wore Victor in Trinidad, and he refereed one of my matches. I think it was Steve Strong and against me. Okay. And he was a he was a referee. All right, uh, I got it mixed up. Was it was it hard to convince uh, Frazier to do the job in the match, or was he? Uh, well, he didn't do a job. He's just right. He ended in a no contest or something like that. Okay. I believe in uh, 1985, you also worked for uh, Pro Wrestling USA, which was uh, Vern Gagne and uh, NWA when they did the joint promotion deal. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, working for uh, Vern? 
Good. In NWA. Good. We always got along with everybody. Who were who were some of the guys that were in the company when you were uh, for AWA? Wow. I don't remember. It's been so long. I don't. I don't. Right. Right. You also had an action figure come out. With Abby. Remco. Yeah. 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 I believe it was one of the first uh, action figures out there with with you involved. So, were you happy to see that in the Yeah, stores? I was happy. I still, I still see it. Some fans bring it to me. Randy, Randy Savage also came into the company. I yeah. believe in 1984. Yeah, right just, before, just before he went to New York. Yeah. What are your memories of uh, good, working with Randy? Good, good, big business, sir. Yeah. What was he like outside the ring? Good, good, good to work with. Good to you know to business with. Right. The whole family, you know, Lanny, his dad, they all worked for us at one time. Did he bring his wife down at all, Elizabeth? When, uh, no, no, were, that was so, before. I don't think they even knew each other. Then. Okay. Because no. I, all right. Um, another, well, you brought in a lot of guys, like we said earlier on, uh, especially from the NWA. Harley Race came in uh, to the territory, and uh, you worked with Harley. What are some of your memories of working with Harley Race? Good, a great professional. Terry and Dory Funk? Terry, yeah, for a long time, yeah, big business. And of course, Stan Hansen, uh, another guy you had tons of uh, matches, board matches, and a lot of gimmick matches with in Puerto Rico. Uh, talk about Stan Hansen. What was he like to do business with? With us, easy, you know, no problem. Dick Murdoch? Good. Some he worked for us a few times. What are some of your uh, memories with uh, Dick Murdoch outside the ring? Good. He, he liked the beer. That's what everybody says. Yeah, we well, used he, he was a good barbecue guy, too. He had an apartment by the beach, and he'd bring the boys, you know, every week. Right. I have a big barbecue. I was there a few times, and good. What about uh, Tully Blanchard? Obviously, you met him in Southwest. Good, a good friend, yeah. I'm very happy that he's been inducted in the Hall of Fame this year. Ronnie he Garvin. A tremendous performer. And uh, Joe LaDuke also came into the yeah, company? He, yeah, he worked for us, so he, he did good business, so... Out of all, all the guys that would come down uh, to work for you, who, I guess who's the one guy besides besides Abdul the Butcher that did really good business for you? Yeah. Other than Abby, it's hard because so many of them did business for so long, you know. It was so easy for us to get those guys over, you know. What all the guys that I cannot, mention, I, I cannot mention one that came down and didn't get over. What was your philosophy for bringing these guys in? Obviously, they're all like big monster heels. You had Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody, and Abby. Was it pretty much, you know, you were the big baby face battling? Well, they had the size and, and the style. They, they, we made sure they were aggressive. Right. Like you said, you know, Hanson, Brody, Abby, they were all, you know, big rugged guys. And, and that's what you needed. Just put them on that TV and the fans were hungry for talent like that. When you would bring a, a Bruiser Brody, what were your plans as far as bringing him in? Like, a, or even a Stan Hanson when, when you first brought these guys in? What just, was... just build them like we did, you know? Right. And that way they can come in and out for big shows and, and, and we would always do big business with them, you know. What are your thoughts on uh, Dutch Mantel? Because he was uh, also a booker for you. Yeah, he's impressive. a great, great, good mind. Good mind for the business? I think he's underrated. I mean, a lot of big companies in the States don't give him the recognition that he deserves. I think he's one of the, has one of the greatest minds in the business. What are some of the, uh, I guess, some of his ideas that really stick out in your mind that Dutch did for, you, for your company? Some of the gimmicks that he came up well, with. Well, I don't want to go into it. But but he was he was very creative. Good guy. Yeah, good guy. Yeah. Out of all your bookers, who was your uh, favorite booker that you had uh, that you employed? Like I said, the only I always did the booking. It's just who's your? But the only one that really you know we had Luke of the Sheepers. He did. He really. He was a real booker for for a year. Right. And Dutch too. He's the other one that really ran his stories. When uh, Luke and and I think Dutch. Dutch, I have a lot of respect for his, his, his way of thinking, you know, wrestling-wise. What are your early memories of uh, Bruiser Brody, the very first time you ever met Bruiser Brody? Good, good. You know, he was, he was a good guy. What was it like to work with him in, inside the ring? I was a little stiff, but he's good. You know, he wouldn't hurt you. Was he ever difficult behind the scenes at all? or? Well, no, not, not with me. I, I really never had any problem with him. Easy to get along with him. Yeah, he was. And obviously he was good business for the company. Yeah, big business. Other than Abby, he was, he was the next. Right. Obviously, I, we're going to talk about it. It's a big uh, story. What, what happened you know, with Bruiser Brody and uh, Jose Gonzalez and Vader number one in, in the locker room? Well, and I really wouldn't like to go into it because I, I don't know really much of it. The only thing I knew that they had differences before. I was going to ask you. I mean, did, did you know that uh, there was heat between the two before the, their 
incident? Did you know that there was like, you know, well, trouble brewing? Not really, I don't until it happened. You know, that's when all those things came out because neither right. one of them, you know, they worked together and everything was fine, you know. All right. If I, I, I knew that it was heat, I, I would have separated, them. separated them and stopped using one of them. Now, I've heard different stories. I'm going to just tell you what I heard. I know, yeah, yeah. I know right. you must have heard a million stories. I'll just, uh, I heard from, you know, Victor told me and a lot of the boys that we've done interviews with said... What, well, Victor Quiñones? Yeah, yeah. I, I talked to Victor when I was in the islands a couple times, and he had told me that back stemming back in the late, I guess, 70s, early 80s, when uh, Jose worked for WWWF as a job guy, that Frank, Frank would be there, or Bruce Brody, and uh, he was a little bit too stiff with him, maybe took, uh, took him to the limits and didn't pay him respect. And then later on down the line, when... Uh, well, f first of all, if he told you that, he lied to you because... Jose Invader was never a job guy for Vince. Right. He was a mid carter. Right, as the Invaders when he yeah. came into the company. No, and before that, he as Jose Gonzalez, he was not a job guy. I was a job guy when I started in 68. Because, you know, I was 18. I was, you know, would you call a job guy? He's a guy that goes on TV. Right. But Jose was, you know, working all the house shows with the Samoans, with, the, you know, Moondocks, and he was not a job guy. But I don't know about those differences. You know, I didn't know about that until. until that incident. So, so that night, did you have you had no sense that there was ever any like no, heat no. between the two? Oh, no, 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 no. That's a, you know, I would have avoided it because right. you know you don't need that. I was going to ask you if if you knew that he was going to. And our business, you know, I heard of business big time. I was going to ask. I'm, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. Um, you were the very first person, I believe, on the scene after after the stabbing took place. And uh, is it true that Bruiser Brody's final words to you were pretty much to ask you know ask you to take care of his family? Not really. He, uh, I really, when, 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 when we went to that room, that what happened had already happened, you know? Right. We just, I, I just helped him out and we put him on the floor and the doctor was there. Where were you, uh... But I don't remember this word because, you know, I was so nervous, everybody, you know, I never seen anything like that in my life. Where were you before the actual incident happened? Were you, you were running the show or were you, uh... I was in the dressing room there. We were all there. All, all the boys were there. You were in the same dressing room as, as yeah. Brody or as... Yeah, okay. as Brody. They, we were all there in the same room. What exactly did you hear? Anything or... No. They went, they went to the back, you know, shower. the shower. Right. And they had a, They were talking like they used to talk all the time. So we never thought, you know... I never, I never thought that, you know, that thing was going to take place because... Right. I would have stopped it. When was the first time that you sensed trouble that night? When did you realize something just happened? When it happened, when the whole commotion, the thing. You actually heard the screaming, yeah. or? Yeah, I heard it some like like a fight, you know. Right. Yeah, like a fight. And yeah. what happened after you heard the commotion? What did you do? Did we you... went in, and my partner went in Victor, and we separated them, and I didn't even know that he was hurt, you know, that until the doctor started. Oh, you, you saw, was Frank lying on the ground at this point in the shower bleeding? Or? No, no, he was not bleeding. No, they were standing there. We separated like you and this kid. Are right. Started fighting, you know, we just pulled him apart. When did you realize that uh, Brody had been stabbed? When the doctor came over. Did you realize how bad it was at first? I didn't know, no. Is it true that uh, Victor Dravica tried to have it, well, they engaged in a shoving match after uh, Jose stabbed him at all? or? No, they, I don't know about that. All right. Somebody Victor said Dravica on sex. Uh, wasn't able to pretty much detain uh, Jose Gonzalez at all. So, what what happened with the uh, the ambulance? What, why did it take so long? It was like twenty five minutes, I guess, before the actual ambulance arrived. I don't know how long it was, but was I, it don't, I don't think it was how long. Really it strong. took a little time, but not. I don't think twenty five minutes. When the paramedics first arrived, did they think it was an angle at all, or did they did they know? It was I don't know really. It's, you know, it's been so long ago and so sad. I I really, you know, I. I wouldn't. I would want to talk about this anymore because it okay. makes just, me sad. You know. I just have a couple more questions, and we'll, we'll definitely move on. Um, did you ever want to cancel the show that night at all, or did you just? No, we were, we were, you know, so confused, and you know, I don't even know what I was doing. You know, nobody was. Do you, do you think it was self? Because we never, we never had anything like that happen. Right. Before or since, you know, and it was, it was, it was terrible. Do you think there was a cover-up at all? I mean, we did interviews with like Tony Atlas and Savio Vega, and they said that uh, the office covered up the uh, actual murder. And, and I mean, do you, do you think there was a cover-up? No, all? we've not. 
The only guy that could have covered was Jovica and I, and, and we didn't do that. Right. You know, we told the, the judge and the, in the courtroom, we said what, what really, what we saw, we didn't really, because I didn't see any stabbing, I didn't see any weapon, I didn't see anything. Do you think it was a, a case of self-defense? Do you think that, I mean, obviously, uh, Jose Gonzalez said that, you know, self-defense. Do you believe it was really self-defense? Oh, I don't know, really, I don't know. You know, I respect the, the law. Right. Dutch Mantel said that um, when we did an interview with Dutch, he claimed that he didn't receive receive his subpoena, I guess, until the day after the trial had ended. Do you, do you believe that? or? I don't know, really. I don't know. Cause I don't know. Okay. Well, after but the, the trial, that was a long time after it happened. Right, so right. he must have received it before. I don't know. How bad did that affect your business, that entire incident? Because, I mean, that was, you know, Gonzalez. It, 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 it affected tremendously. You know, in a negative way because, you know, right. a lot of fans, you know, stopped going because they figured, well, this is too much, you know. Did a lot of the American guys that you book, I know Abby was one of them, Tony Alice said they weren't going to work there anymore. How did you take that? Did you take it as a personal insult or did you... Did no, they right? were. They were. I know they came back eventually. No, they came back right away almost. We had, you know, we kept running with the same, you know, the Yumblers were there. They, they were sad. We were all sad, you know. We lost a good friend. I'm just looking at my notes real quick. And a good talent, too, for us. The company does more than anybody. Right, right. Because he was a big draw for us. At what point did you um, say, all right, I, I'm going to either continue to, to work with uh, Jose Gonzalez or, or not work with him? I mean, what, how did that decision come about for you to continue working with uh, Jose Gonzalez after that incident? Well, he, 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 when he came, you know, innocent, then we couldn't really hold that against him because, you know, we'd be being prejudiced. Right. You know. Um, years later, I don't know how true this is, did Gonzalez go on TV at all and brag about killing uh, Bruiser Brody like years later? Is that true? I don't know, but I doubt it. I don't think he's that kind of a guy. Okay. You know, nobody could, you know, shit. Right. I guess we'll, we'll move on now. But a lot of people say a lot of bad things about, you know, he's not the most popular guy anyway. Jose so Gonzalez? A lot of, a lot of, yeah, so a lot of people, you know. They take this to, to, to really run him down, and, and it's sometimes unfair because, you know, they say things about him that aren't true. Right, right. Did you, uh, what was your contact with uh, his wife, Barbara? What did you say to her after the incident happened? I mean, oh, it was how tough. emotional was that? Thing I mean, for me to really say, very really hard, yeah. Right. She stayed at my house with the kid. Right. Her wow. son. And... All right. Um, after that had happened, I believe in 2005, you had the uh, Bruiser Brody Memorial Cup. Do you, do you think that was in poor taste for the company to promote it as the Bruiser Brody Memorial Show? Or? No, because uh, he was uh, one of our great stars. Okay. Like we have the Abdullah Memorial, and we have, you know. Right, right. All right. How did you feel, I believe, in 1991, uh, Onita, he, he did the uh, FMW angle where they did the stabbing with Victor Quiones and, and got Gonzalez, where uh, Gonzalez stabbed Onita in the stomach. Do you think that was done in poor taste, that angle? After I everything don't know, really. Happened? I I had nothing to do with that, and when I heard about it, I, I thought it was bullshit. You know? Bad business. Bad business, bad taste. That you don't do that. All right. Did you have heat at all with Victor Quiones at this point in time when he left the company? Because we'll, we'll talk about when he started IWC coming up. Um, when he went over to Japan and, and started the Wings, did you and Victor already have a falling out at all? Or no, no, no. He, you know, he wanted to become independent and, and do his own thing, and you know, right. he had the right to do that. Memories of uh, Hercules Ayala. You guys had uh, the very first fire match, I believe, in 1988. What are your memories of uh, working Hercules Ayala? Another big heel that you guys had. Big heel, yeah. He drew a lot of money for us for a lot of years. Good talent, good, good, good guy. And then, uh, like a lot of people, like I said earlier, you know, copied the style of your company. You're definitely a true pioneer in the business for some of the stuff you did uh, in, I guess, the late 90s. Uh, early 90s, I'm sorry, Onita did the fire match uh, in, in Japan, uh, an FMW. What are your, what are your thoughts on uh, FMW uh, copying your style doing the fire matches? You think it's just flattering or? Yeah, it's flattering, yeah, he, because here you, we don't know anything, you know, like, say somebody copy his move, that move, you know, nobody owns anything, everybody can do what they want to do, you know? Right. But, but I'm flattered that they, you know, they mentioned that they got it from us. Memories of working with the uh, Iron Sheik when he would come into the territory. He was another guy close to Abdullah as far as getting over quick, you know. When we brought him over, he, uh, I guess he was over from the TV in WWF. Right. 
Easy to work with? Easy to work with, yeah. Crazy outside the Crazy, right? yeah, yeah. Crazy <laughs> as hell, but... You have to do a lot Good of box people. office attraction. Manny Fernandez, what are your memories of uh, the bull? Manny Fernandez? Oh, he was a little difficult, yeah, at times. Just ego purposes, or...? No, just, yeah, problem, personal problem. But, okay. you know, basically a good guy. You guys did the uh, infamous angle where uh, Manny jumped off the top rope onto Invader's stomach and uh, Invader drank all the goat's blood and coughed up the blood. How awesome was that for your uh, TV for uh, box office? That, that that was a little too strong. We got You got in trouble for that? That publicity, yeah. yeah. What, what happened? Well, you know, on TV, it was a little strong for TV. Did you get kicked off any stations or? No, no, but uh, we got a memo. You got heat. <laughs> All right, we were talking about uh, Manny Fernandez and him working for you. Said he was a little difficult to work with at times. Um, after Manny Fernandez came in, you uh, had other guys come in as well, like uh, Yokozuna. He came in for a little bit. Coquina. Yeah, yeah, Coquina. Yeah, F a few times. Yeah. Easy to work with. Uh, good yeah. wrestler. Yeah, good wrestler. Yeah. Alpha and Sika were pretty much family yeah. members, so you worked yeah. with them a lot. For a the, long time. Yeah. So you know, like the family history there. Yeah. Uh, what are your memories of uh, Steve DeSalvo, Steve Strong? Hard to work with. Why is Very that? Difficult. A lot of people say he was a nightmare to work with. Yeah, he was. It was worse than that. <laughs> just what was? What do you think? He's just so difficult, you know. He's... Um, in a, I guess in the late '80s and early '90s, your your business started to go downhill a little bit with the gate. Why do you? Uh, what was that? In, in, I guess the very late 80s, early 90s, was business bad for you guys? No, no, it was so good. Late 80s, we set records. Uh, it was in the mid-90s. Mid-90s? To, you know, the end of the 90s. What do you think uh, happened? What, what made the business change? Uh, it was a number of things, you know, mainly, you know, I was getting older and getting out of the business. and. So it was time to pretty much bring in new guys, and yeah. that's when you brought in uh, TNT, Savio Vega, Miguel Perez Jr., Hurricane Castillo, and... No, they came before. They were in already... The before, yeah. Savio was big for us. For, you know. He was, yeah, I was going to ask you, let's talk about... Not Miguel. Miguel was just so so, but Savio was big. Talk about Savio Vega. We did an interview with him, and he talked about how he got to start with you and uh, his character. We taught him everything. He was a security guard. Right. And we, we made him a wrestler and turned him into a big star. And obviously, uh, later on down the line... We gave him his character, everything. Right, right. His name, his pain, everything. So you saw the big potential in TNT and his whole gimmick and early on? Not so much in him, in, in the gimmick. You know, the, the ninja was hot. Right. That, that, that thing, you know. So we figured, well, let's try with him, because he was a legit karate guy. Right. Black belt, so we figured, well, let's try him, and it worked. What about uh, Miguel Perez Jr., some of your memories of... Uh... No, no, we never... He worked for us, but he was, you know, just an up-and-down guy. What about uh, Hurricane Castillo Jr.? Same thing, you know, yeah. Jose Estrada Jr.? Uh, he didn't work for us too much, you know, just a little bit. He's other brother, Julio. Right. Rico Suave, he worked for us a lot. He's, he's a good wrestler. Now, Savio, he also worked in the office for you, right? No, no. He never helped book it or no, run the didn't. locker room at all? No, he, just didn't strictly he, talent? he didn't have the ability for that. At least we didn't think so. Okay. What are, uh, I guess, uh, Hugo Stavanovich, one of your uh, announcers. What, yeah. are you, what are your memories of uh, working with Hugo? Great kid. We took him from, he was just a young wrestler doing jobs, you know? Right. And we saw the potential in him, and slowly we brought him up. First, he was the manager, and he did a great job at that. Then... We needed a commentator, and we turned him loose. Over the years, you know, back in the uh, '90s, he obviously uh, had some drug problems. Um, what are what are your thoughts on uh, his problems? Obviously, now he's back and clean and working for the WWE full time, and he retired, I believe, recently too. From those yeah, days. he did. Yeah. Um, what are your memories of uh, Hugo as far as his problems? Did you uh, did you sense that at all when he was? No, I didn't. No, 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 because I don't get involved in their personal lives. You know, right. nobody. Now, did you have any offers at all uh, to work for the WWF uh, in the 80s, the late 80s, or even the 90s? No, because I, I was too busy with my territory and I wasn't going to, you know, give that up for nothing. How did your uh, appearance in the 1993 Royal Rumble come about? Oh, it's a good experience. I enjoyed it. What are your memories of that? Did Gorilla get you hooked up with there? Or? Yeah, Gorilla did, yeah. What are your memories of, uh, you know, working the, the Rumble? It was great, you know, it was there amongst the a whole bunch of you know, big international stars. Right. At the time, it was, it was, it was, it was great. 
And I believe Grill Monsoon, even on commentary, put you over and he, he said that you're a youngster. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, you, were, you were like 45, I think, at the time, right? Uh, well, what year was that? I think it was 93, yeah. 93? Yeah, how was that? Eddie Gilbert, we talked about him uh, earlier on. He came in, I believe, and uh, around 95, right before his death. Um, was he booking at all, helping you uh, do some of the storylines? Yeah, when he died, yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was uh, helping out with the book. What are your memories of Eddie? Because I remember uh, right before that, he had called me to get some tapes. He wanted to watch fire matches because he was going to do a big fire match with you. And uh, I gave him a bunch of stuff. Um, what, what are your memories of uh, Eddie? He was very dedicated, you know, to the business. You know, he he lived for the business. What are your memories of his uh, final? Very talented, huh? What, he, had, I guess, his final match was with a bear, a wrestling bear. Yeah. How how did that come about? Good, good, good. He could he could get anything over. Even wrestling with a bear. What are your thoughts on uh, his passing? His you know, on time. Sad, death? sad, sad. He's so young and so talented. And what was the uh, drug scene like in Puerto Rico? Is it a big drug scene? No, no. It's just uh... almost nothing now. Okay. What are your thoughts on uh, Victor Quiones and Savio Vega when they started uh, IWA Puerto Rico in 1999, and then they were pretty much running opposition to you guys? Um, talk about some of the uh, behind-the-scenes politics that happened there and, and, and the, the war that you guys pretty much had, because you guys were both battling over you know, TV and, and towns. Um, what, are your, what are some of your memories that stand out? Well, like you said, it was a war, you know. Uh, we underestimated them, really. I didn't think. Uh, Dutch Mantel was the key. If Dutch Mantel hadn't gone there, they would have never succeeded. So you think Dutch pretty much helped them? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Okay. How much bad blood was there? At the it wasn't about blood. It was all business, you know. It was all business. Like, yeah. Would you guys ever try to like sabotage? sabotage no, no, I never did. No, no, I never did. I don't believe in doing stuff like that. What was the? And uh, they know it too. Right. What was the big dispute that actually led to uh, Jose Gonzalez to jump from WWC to IWA? Because, I mean, that was pretty big. I don't know. You're going to have to ask him. Okay. <laughs> we'll never talk about that. He's working for me now? Right. He's back with you guys. Yeah. How big of an advantage was IWA's promotional relationship with the WWF at the time? Because they were working uh, very close with WWF. WWF would send them talent. WWE, I'm sorry, at the time, would send them key guys. Did that hurt you at all, you think? Because they were getting, uh, like, the Tommy Dreamers would go down there and it would, uh, super crazy to Jerry went down there a little bit, and uh, they would get other guys in there as well. Well, it, it helped them because you know the WWE had the TV there, you know. They, so any, right. anytime you get talent like that, it, it's going to help you. What happened to your relationship with WWE at the time? Why, why weren't they sending talent to you guys? No, because at the time Savio was working for them. Okay. So you know. Right. Was a, How can you give somebody a talent and that, you know? Right, it was all business. He's like, now, now we're working with WWE and, and we get talent from Right, them. it was just, you know. So, and just before they got it, I was getting, I was getting talent from them. I but mean, it was just so that Savio was working for them at the time. Right. And I guess he, he saw the opportunity, he said, well, I'm here. So he talked to the bosses and uh, he got him to send talent. How close did WWC come to going out of business at its lowest point? Was there ever a time where you said, all right, you know, houses are really down, maybe it's time to pull a plug on the company at all? Or? We never thought of that. Okay. Never, never, not once. We've gone through tough times, but we never, that idea had never crossed our mind. Victor claimed that he actually uh, loaned you guys money between 2002 and 2005 to keep you guys afloat. Is that true at all? Or? No, he's, he talked a lot of shit. So, right. You know, he's dead, but... What are your thoughts on Victor's passing with uh, Somas and all that? I don't know. I don't, you know, I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know he was taking that. All right. It's you know, to me. He, he's a good friend of ours. Um, as far as like his his lifestyle and and you know, it's no secret. You know, the stuff that went on behind the scenes with him and, and young workers. What What are your thoughts on uh, all the allegations over the years that have come out with different guys saying you know Victor would try to sexually hit on them or, or stuff like that? Do you think it was a uh, True, or do you think it was bullshit? I don't know, really. I don't. You don't really. It's businesses. Yeah, I don't. It doesn't affect you. Get personal stuff like that, dude. Exactly. All right. Um, what What is the current state right now in Puerto Rico uh, of the business? Do you it, think it will ever go back to the '80s, or? I don't know if we can go back to that because you know it was big then, super big, but it's coming up, definitely coming up now. 
And Savio Vega, I believe, returned to you guys too last year, right? To, a, to work for you. A couple of just a couple shots, times. but that nothing, you know, nothing major. Hmm. Um, did you ever want to be the heel? No. Always like being a babyface. Yeah, because it's what I know how to do best. So. Did you ever consider turning heel at all? No, never. No. Never. Have. All right. Um, I guess. How did you come about with the uh, your signature cartwheel spot? When when did you first start doing it? Oh, I don't remember. When I first started in Puerto Rico. How many times have you held the uh, WWC Universal Heavyweight title? They say 26 times. It's so many, I don't remember. I was going to ask you, it was about 26. 26 times. All right. Let's talk about your sons, Carlito and Eddie, uh, Primo, both who have debuted in, uh, I believe, 1999. As kids, did they tell you that they wanted to get into the business? Did you always know that? No, no. They, they didn't say it. they didn't want to, but they never showed. Right. And I never thought they were going to follow my footsteps that way. And you also trained, uh, I believe, Orlando, who was now in WWE, as uh, at the go? Uh, I, I didn't really train him. He, he, he was going to college in, in Michigan. Right. In uh, Kalamazoo, I believe. Was in Michigan? On a baseball scholarship. And while he was going there to study and play ball, in the afternoon, when his time off, he would uh, go and take classes. Wow. So at what point did Wrestling they... Wrestling classes, you know. What point did uh, Carlito come to you and say, hey, I want to, you know, get into the business? And well, actually, it was Dutch Mantel that got him in the business. Touched it? With a storyline. Right. With Ray Gonzalez. Right. Um, were you for that? I mean, did you ever try to say, hey, this is something that you don't want to get into? Or? No, because, I, you know, the business has been good to me and I lost the business, you know. And the only thing I wanted them to go to college before they... If they were going to... Do this full time. I wanted to get an education first. Just for back. And they did. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Your daughter, I believe, her name's Stacy. Is she also? Uh, is she did it. She she likes it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, were you happy that uh, Carlito eventually got signed by WWE? Yeah. Right. Thanks to uh, Jerry Briscoe and I helped. You know, through Jerry, I helped get him in there. Right. No, you know, early on when he first came in, he was pretty outspoken about not getting a big push in the, in the company. Why, why do you think? Because when I first saw Carlito on TV, you know, he could talk, he, you know, he had the look, and uh, yeah. why do you think the, the office never really gave him the ball? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, no, I don't know. They have, they have their own way of doing business, you know. Right. You can't, I can't criticize them because they're, they're successful, so. But, you know, when you're in Rome, you do what the Romans do. Right. And if you don't like it, you get out. Did he ever call you uh, from the road and say, you know? No, no, he's very, you know, he's very he keeps to himself, and I give him advice, but he never asks. You know, he keeps me out of it. Right. What are your memories of the, the 2005 uh, house show that you guys did? The angle with uh, Carlito and Ric Flair in, in San Juan, where Carlito spit the apple at your face and you know attacked you, and then Flair made the save. Yeah, that was good. Good stuff. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. The crowd eat it up, or? Oh, tremendously. What are your thoughts on uh, Carlito's trouble WWE run? And you know, eventually he was let go after failing the wellness test and uh, refused to go to rehab. W what are your thoughts on you know all of that that that, that went down? I mean, well, it was, it was a mistake he made, and you know, I wish he hadn't made it. But now he's he's over that. You know, he's in good shape. He's clean, and I'd like to see him go back to the WWE again. Do you think he will go back? I mean, I hope he does. I know if if he ever does. And he gets the ball, he's going to take it home. Without a doubt. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, Primo and uh, Epico's current tag team title push right now? Very good, good, good tag team. They do. You know, they do a lot of good stuff. Do you think, you know, obviously WWE's always been obsessed with size and, and bigger guys. Do you, do you think it's uh, a miracle that, you know, they're giving those guys a push? No, but now, size? if you notice, recently they, they, they're using a lot of smaller guys. Right. You saw that kid Aaron Bourne, he's very small, and our truth is not a giant, and neither is... Kofi Kingston and they 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 get a good push. Are you actually going to be at the show on Sunday? Obviously. For yeah. Me. Yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about this. Uh, in two thousand and one, was your brother murdered, Noel? Or yeah. What what happened there? Was it a, just a, a bad incident? Well, he was he was the president of the team service, and it was something some problem he had in that organization with you know one of the members and. You know, he was doing bad things, and my brother is straight, you know. And right, right. He, he wasn't going to allow, you know, monkey business in the union, and I guess 
disgruntled guy. Yeah, that's probably, you know, I don't know much of it, but from what I hear, that's really what took place. Does the guy go to jail, hopefully? Or? Oh, yeah, he's doing live without pro. Oh, good. How did you get involved with uh, boxing? Because you were involved in a controversial scoring of, I believe, Devin Alexander and the uh, HBO match. Lucas, uh, I don't want to mispronounce his last name, Mathis? No. No? I don't know. I don't know what you get that, sir. You never did any box? No. Okay. No, never. Okay. Well, a bad question. Where did you get that? I have no <laughs> idea. It was on all my list of questions. He, no, he's the one that got it, right? Yeah. So, um, any thoughts on a possible introduction in the WWE Hall of Fame, excluding family? Uh, like, who, who would you want to choose? If, if you were to be, uh, you know, opted to be in the Hall of Fame for WWE, who would you want to uh, give the speech to induct you in, into the Hall of Fame? Oh, Carlino. Carlito? Definitely, yeah. If you couldn't have Carlito, who else would you want? Maybe Abby? <laughs> no, Abby is not a talking guy, you know. I, I don't know if you know. Like, he, through his career, he never spoke. Right, right. Because that's, that's not his strong point. Looking back at your career, what is your fondest memories? If you could have, like, uh, two matches to put on videotape to show your grandchildren, what, what matches would they be? It's hard because so many, really. All right. So many now that we have a few tapes, DVDs of, of my matches, and I watched some of them, and I didn't know they were that good. You know, I, right. I had some great ones, Hercules Ayala, many good ones with Abby, a few, quite a few with Ric Flair, too. You, you know, still watch the business today? Charlie Blanchard and I, but, you know, Humdingers. Right. Yeah, Garvin and I, super matches. Dick Steinborn, but we don't have tape of that because Right. This is way back. This time or I wrestled many hour matches. We had one 90 man match. All right, all right. That was, you know, classic. Looking back, um, who was the one guy you liked to work with the most? Oh, I enjoy working with a lot of guys, you know, like I, I enjoy the funks a lot. Both of them, two different styles. But I enjoy both of them. Uh, Ronnie Garvin was solid, but I like working with him. Right. Flair, forget it. Harley Race, one of my favorites, yeah. What do you think is the biggest misconception about the uh, Puerto Rico uh, wrestling scene? Is there anything you want to say to people that might be watching this? What do you mean misconception? Like, like what? you know, obviously there's a room with the fans being crazy. If there's anything that ever, you know, this is your time to say it, that you want to clear, clear the air um, and say, get off your chest. Something that people think that's true that might not be true. Like anything involving the Bruiser Brody case? or anything? Well, the Bruiser Brody, they exaggerate a lot. They also exaggerate about the fans being as violent as they say they are. I admit, you know, they're pretty hot-blooded, but they're not, you know, murderers or assassins like, you know, some of these guys say they are. All right. Do you still watch uh, TNA at all? Do you ever watch uh, the kind I watch, of I watch, all, you know, not, not every week, but, you know, right. I watch it. What, what are your thoughts on uh, TNA's product? I think it's a good product, but I think it's lacking something. And I can't really pinpoint it. I like sometimes I watch it. I like to be able to say, "Where well, is this? Right. That is missing." But I can't. You think? The but I know it's missing something because the talent, the roster is is great. You know, it's as good as any. Right. Exactly. But but it's I don't know. It's, it's missing something. Do you think the booking's bad there at all? I mean, no. Some of the storylines are good. It's just I don't know. All right. If I remember, I call you and I'll tell you. But. <laughs> Has Carlito ever had any discussions about going to TNA at all during his time away? From no, he never showed an interest. I asked him, he said, ah. Right. No. Do you follow MMA at all? Do you watch any... Uh, all a little bit. I, I, you know, it's too... Not an affection for me. Do you think UFC has hurt the wrestling business? No, I don't think so. No. It's two different things. Two different animals? Yeah. yeah. Right. Where, where do you see the wrestling business in the next five years? Do you think it's going to come back? Right now, obviously, it's a down period, and the business goes up and down in cycles. It'll come up again, yeah, right, yeah. It'll, it, wrestling is, goes in cycles. Who, who do you think the next big star is out there? Obviously, right now, you know, John Cena's the top guy, and, and Randy Orton's... Who, who do you think is the next John Cena, the next Hulk Hogan? I don't know to that level, but uh, Randy Orton is a tremendous performer. He's, he's great. Besides your, your family members, who are some guys that you like to watch on TV? Who, who are you a fan of today in, in, in the business? I like I like Randy. He's, he's good. For their work and all. He, you know, he, he reminds me of the our times, you know. Right. 
You also got uh, another guy I didn't mention, Mr. Pogo. He came into the uh, the company. Pogo, he, he 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 drew big money for us. And Kendo Nakazaki. Kendo, yeah. What are your memories of uh, working with those two guys? Good. Good guys. Good guy, yeah. Um, in closing, I don't, I don't have any other questions. Do you have any questions you might want to ask? No. All right. In closing, is there anything you want to say to your fans out there that you never had a chance to say to until now? Well, uh, to keep uh, supporting wrestling, and you know, it's, it's a good form of entertainment. And uh, you know, we need them. The sport needs them to to continue and, and to come back up to the level that it was in my country as well as in the states right, right. and all over the world. You know. Well, definitely, we want to thank you for being here today for this interview, and uh, hopefully, we'll be doing another one in another ten years or something with you. So, always a pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.